From where you're kneeling must seem like an 18 karat run of bad luck. The truth is, the game was rigged from the start. Fallout New Vegas is a role-playing game set in the retro future post-apocalyptic Mojave Desert. You take control of Courier 6, someone who made their calves by taking deliveries to and fro, but quickly becomes wrapped up in a tangled web of politics that, when unraveled, will decide who controls the future of New Vegas and its people. They say war never changes. Where there's an opportunity for control, there is always someone trying to seize it. Some are just better than others. For the Mojave and New Vegas, these are the major players in that battle for supremacy. The New California Republic, Caesar's Legion, and Mr. House. In addition to those, there is also the option of an independent New Vegas under the rule of the Courier and Yes Man. Bad robot! Bad robot! This is achieved by going against the three main factions when it comes time to get down to business at the Hoover Dam. This is wide open to interpretation because everyone in their Courier is going to have a dramatically different outlook and philosophy on how things should be run. So rather than go on a long-winded rant about my dumb thoughts, just tell me in the comments below what you would do as the de facto leader of the Mojave. Of course, there's also always the option of just shredding the social contract, scattering it to the wind, and leaving the Mojave at the mercy of raiders, mutants, and the harsh elements. Are you tired of getting chased because you're bigger than humans and scaring them? Did you kill some and they overreacted? A truly independent New Vegas with no gods, no kings, only man's darkest whims unabated. But that's not fun or even likely because if humanity is good at anything, it's assembling into large groups and claiming that you own everything. So for the sake of simplicity, we'll just leave this discussion to the real players at the table, NCR, The Legion, and Mr. House. Whoever emerges victorious in the battle for Hoover Dam will assume total control over the region for the foreseeable future. And it begs the question, who should run New Vegas? Which of these factions or leaders has an ideology or set of values that best suits the people of the Mojave and their future? Before we dive into each group, let's first establish what makes a good society so that we have a consistent way to evaluate them. I have assembled five spectra that we'll use to evaluate each group. These are the needs of a functional society. Whoever can fulfill them best will be crowned the ruler of the Mojave. The first is basic physical needs. This is a simple one to explain. Does everyone have what they need so they can continue existing in the most basic sense? Unless you are presiding over a bunch of ghouls who have a dramatically reduced need for sustenance, having reliable access to food, water, shelter, and adequate healthcare must be the priority. Next is safety and security. Once you can ensure that your people are fed, sheltered, and not dying from fucking dysentery or whatever, you'll need to protect them from violence and crime, whichever way that expresses itself. Whether it's the odd raider party looking to plunder you, a warring imperial force wanting to expand into your land and take your resources, or from within so that people can walk the streets with confidence that they won't be cut down by roving bands of unwashed ruffians fiending for drug money. Then there's economic stability. Like it or not, money is power. The more of it you can grab hold of, the more influence, access to resources, and stability you have. A nation's economy is a reflection of who they are, what they do, and what they hope to achieve. A diverse, sustainable, and productive economy ensures everyone has what they need and enough confidence to push forward into the future without fear. There's also needs of the mind and hearts, which is intentionally vague because this is the most subjective of any of the needs we've talked about so far. A society's cultural or social values are different for any group of people and are constantly evolving as time goes on. So for a given faction, I'll evaluate whether or not they empower their people to participate in and pursue their own educational, social, or cultural needs without judgment, oppression, or persecution. Within reason, of course. If I see one motherfucker starting a Johnny Guitar Cult, I'm burning this whole thing to the ground. And finally, justice and equality. This means fairness, impartiality, and the equitable treatment of all individuals, regardless of gender, race, or socioeconomic status. It includes creating and upholding a law that benefits everyone, not just the wealthy and powerful, protecting rights, and holding accountable jerkwads who stray from whatever ethical or legal standards are established. It's no way to live if you have to operate with a constant fear that everything you have is at the mercy of some asshole taking it without consequence. This also means acknowledging and safeguarding the inherent freedoms and liberties of each person. Justice is trust. Justice is security. Justice is the social contract. Now that we've laid the groundwork for what makes an ideal society, let's talk about each faction and how they stack up against those standards. 
We'll talk about each one's beliefs, strengths, weaknesses, and what it might look like if they were in charge. And we'll start with the New California Republic. The New California Republic, or NCR, was established in the year 2189 as an inheritor of the pre-war values of democracy, personal liberty, and the rule of law. They've developed a culture of expansionism, leading a number of colonization and military endeavors into the feral wastes to wave their wand of enlightenment and convert the boorish rabble into productive members of their society. They consider themselves a federal republic, meaning a federation of states is connected by a republic form of government. Basically, it's the exact same setup as the pre-war United States. The NCR represents the status quo. They embody the systems and ways of life that were seen before the bombs fell. They say history is doomed to repeat by those who fail to learn from it. So it's not unreasonable to have some hesitation in just automatically jumping on the NCR train and calling it a day. The NCR is resurrecting the systems and ways of thought from a world that destroyed itself in spectacular fashion. There are absolutely some benefits to designing your government as a democratic republic, but also some genuinely devastating drawbacks that should give anyone pause. It allows the people to have a voice, elect the people they want to represent them, and let them change their minds every few years as their needs change. However, there is rarely any incentive to protect against the manipulation of public opinion. The people are heard, but what is done to ensure they aren't told what to say? Media, marketing, and political campaigns bombard voters and influence their opinion for better or worse. The short terms that are served by public officials make those political campaigns even more powerful as candidates spend more time focused on getting re-elected than performing their duties. And think of the average person. Would you trust them to make the right call in a world of chaos? Democracy also enables the rule of law, holding everyone to the same standard, regardless of their position or status, theoretically. There's always some wiggle room and flexibility when money and power are involved. The checks and balances offered by their former government are also what makes it inefficient and incapable of the decisiveness that may be necessary in times of crisis or turmoil. The NCR is also uniquely prone to corruption amid its ranks. I think Cassandra Moore at the Hoover Dam sums up the NCR the best. The NCR is progress. If you wander around the wasteland, you'll find all sorts of tribes, villages, and such where people spend most of their time trying to survive. The NCR gives its citizens a shot at something more. We have laws, currency, health care, government, all the things that were lost. It's not perfect, but it's worth protecting, which is why we also have the largest military in existence. The NCR is extremely well endowed in terms of satisfying the needs of a society. They have the infrastructure and means to provide the basic physical needs of food, water, shelter, and healthcare. They boast the largest fighting force ever seen since the world exploded in 2077. So its people experience a sense of security that few others can enjoy. They have an expansive network of trade routes and agreements that allow its economy to expand and dominate wherever it wants. It's a free market system that is primarily focused on two arenas great Brahmin herds and large swaths of highly arable land that provide meat, leather, milk, and a number of other foodstuffs, and those combined form the backbone of the NCR economy. However, their free market also gave power to the wealthiest and most influential as they gobbled up more and more land in Brahmin, leading to a monopoly on their most valuable resources. NCR's economic backbone is in the hands of the few, leaving only scraps for the many to fight over if they want to control their own economic destiny. As for the needs of the mind and heart, the NCR maintains the most advanced society known in the wasteland, one that encourages its people to push science and technology further with its sharecropper farms, standardized manufacturing using the best materials, and a number of impressive advancements in medicine. Their people are educated and their minds are stimulated. They enforce freedom of religions so anyone can practice whatever beliefs they want so long as it isn't violent or psychotic. Do you remember the good old days where the master ruled over us all? For justice and equality, they also have a strict law that prohibits discrimination based on gender, ethnicity, sexuality, or religious beliefs. Mutants also enjoy protection, but enforcing those laws have been inconsistent at best. Their legislation on paper seems to satisfy the needs of the mind and hearts and justice and equality. The NCR present themselves as a well-meaning entity, bringing order to the chaos of the wastes, and to their credit, they have done a great job. But it's clear that as Brahmin and agricultural barons increase their stranglehold on the wealth and resources, the NCR's interests are aligned with them and not with the people. Their free market is slowly backfiring into an oligarchy where the few have real control and the many are forced to bend to their whims. Their political system is flexible by design, 
they recognize the need for periodic course changes as they navigate the choppy waters of nation building, but doing so leaves them exposed to manipulation. Whoever has the means to dump money into a political campaign to get their person elected and then lobby that person into submission is the one who holds real power. So despite the incredible standard of living that the NCR can provide, it's hard not to look at them and think that they're building a replica of a society that couldn't help but destroy itself and is doing even less to protect itself from corruption as it relentlessly expands wherever it seems to be most profitable, with no regard for who they take it from. Next is Caesar's Legion. Caesar's Legion was founded in 2277 as a totalitarian dictatorship run by Edward Caesar Sallow. The Legion relies on the conquest and enslavement of tribal societies that it comes across to survive. They draw inspiration from the military structure of the Roman Empire to maintain order in the absence of any meaningful civilian institutions. Caesar is the sole holder of power as he commands his forces deeper into the American Southwest. It started with Caesar instructing a group of unpracticed fighters in the art of war so that they could protect themselves from the warring tribes around them. Caesar's efforts were so successful that, under his guidance, those fighters were not only able to defend themselves but outright dominate their enemies, subjugating and reorganizing them under his banner, which came to be known as the Legion. Rinse and repeat, and eventually Caesar conquered 87 tribes. Once conquered, tribals are stripped of their identity and culture. Those who surrender are conscripted into Caesar's army, while the rest are either enslaved or killed. There is no other tribe than the Legion itself. The non-tribal people who live in the Legion-controlled territory are not considered legionaries. They are subjects of the Legion, living in cities and towns under its control, and are generally left free to do whatever they wish as long as they do not interfere with Legion operations or endanger its position. Subjects of the Legion are granted a stable, consistent flow of electricity and water, a stable and ample food supply, and very low crime and corruption rate. However, this comes with the expectation that they must never disobey the Legion. This generally means that subjects have virtually no political freedom, rights, or influence in what happens to them or their communities. Caesar also is not fond of drugs or alcohol, so partying is non-existent. That alone might be enough to cast the Legion out of New Vegas. The Legion follows a strict policy of frontier justice, wiping out all savage, chem-dependent raider gangs and tribes they deem to be unfit for absorption into their ranks. While this is a harsh way to ensure peace within their territory, it's also extremely effective. The Legion can provide the most consistent protection anywhere in the wasteland. The Legion, as a totalitarian dictatorship lording over an army of slaves, is largely frowned upon by the wider world for its violation of basic human rights. People rightfully take issue with the whole slave army thing. Caesar can offer ruthless efficiency, stability, and security for his people, as he values survival and long-term sustainability, but it comes at the ultimate cost of individual identity and rights. An individual under him has no value beyond their utility to the Legion. Politically, this philosophy is expressed as a general disdain for democracy, as a weak, ineffective system that fosters disunity, greed, and self-interest. Democracy has been its weakness, not its strength. At the expense of the collective and the greater good. It's not built to last. I'm just hastening the inevitable. The Legion easily satisfies basic physical needs, with the exception of healthcare, as they believe that victory without sacrifice is not worth achieving. Food, water, and shelter are plentiful, if you're not a slave. The Legion easily satisfies safety and security, as Caesar has cleansed his conquered lands of anything that doesn't wave his banner. It's not uncommon to walk the streets of Legion lands with no fear of danger, if you're not a slave. The Legion easily satisfies economic stability, as Caesar goes to extreme lengths to maintain order in every possible measure, including their access and distribution of resources, if you're not a slave. It's the needs of the mind and heart and justice and equality that suffer under Caesar's rule. Their social structure resembles a colony of ants more closely than a collection of actual human beings. Individuals are dispensable tools and a means to an end rather than ends in themselves. People do not have agency or freedom to pursue their own goals or aspirations. The Legion employs a very strict hierarchy and clear division of roles between sexes. Legionaries are their main fighting force, composed of able-bodied men enslaved by the Legion or born into it. They have only one purpose, to fight for Caesar until they fall in battle. Women are expressly forbidden from fighting, being considered breeding stock, and treated as money to be rewarded among legionaries. They are caretakers, healers, midwives, and breeders, fulfilling roles essential to maintaining the Legion's continuous campaign of expansion. 
Caesar himself is not particularly prejudiced against any sex, or rather he treats them as tools built for specific purposes. In his eyes, why use a spoon for a steak or a fork for soup? If you aren't fighting for Caesar or providing him with more able-bodied pawns via your loins, your only other option is to be a slave, toiling away while adhering to the virtues of honesty, industry, and prudence. Religious beliefs are strictly limited to the cult of Mars, where Caesar is worshipped as the son of Mars, Mars being the Roman god of war. Caesar's divine duty is to conquer all of Earth and deliver the wasteland from chaos and barbarism. Children are indoctrinated at birth as they are removed from their families and given to priestesses of Mars to grow up under this belief. Anyone who dares stray from Caesar's divine rule is executed. Under Caesar's rule, you are given everything you could possibly need to survive, but only so that you may devote yourself to him. Is that a life worth living? Servitude to a greater good that doesn't serve you? And next we have Mr. House. Mr. House is the president, CEO, and sole proprietor of the Free Economic Zone of New Vegas which he established after rebuilding the ruins of Las Vegas like a neon phoenix with nipple tassels rising from the ashes. By the time the events of New Vegas are unfolding, Mr. House is the enigmatic overlord of the Strip, who's tucked away inside the Lucky 38 casino and behind countless computer screens, shrouding his true identity and even his mortality in mystery. No one knows who he is or where he came from. He was once known as Robert House and was born in the pre-war era. He built an empire of wealth, technology, and influence through sheer willpower, intelligence, and savvy business acumen before the bombs dropped. Using everything he had at his disposal, he was able to predict the impending apocalypse accurately and began making preparations. He went to great lengths to ensure that Las Vegas would survive nuclear Armageddon. Then he placed his physical body into a life-supporting device and connected his brain to a massive network of computers making him effectively immortal and able to assert his will on the world using his army of Robco brand Securitron robots. Mr. House has dreams of a utopic future in which the New Vegas Strip is at the center and under his unquestioned authority. His long-term goal is to make the Strip into an unstoppable economic machine that will serve as the foundation for reigniting mankind's technological progress. He wants to be humanity's hero by profiting off our most hedonistic and depraved desires one exotic dancer and slot machine at a time. He looks down on his fellow man, seeing himself as not among them, but instead benevolently watching over them, believing that if left to their own devices, they will destroy themselves all over again. He views the NCR as another example of the failed experiment of democracy, and Caesar's Legion as a bunch of savages. To him, he and he alone must guide mankind through the mess they made. For the time being, all Mr. House wants is a completely independent New Vegas, free from outside influence like the NCR or the Legion. Mr. House cares little for the waste beyond the walls of the Strip. Unless, of course, there's something he can exploit for profit, or there's a concern that needs to be dealt with. Within his walls, anything goes, as long as it makes him money and doesn't undermine his authority. A direct result of Mr. House's disinterest in legislating people's behavior is the absence of any checks and balances on himself or anyone else. Although he would have the free economic zone become an independent, dynamic, high technology enterprise zone, he claims he would not intervene in the affairs of the people, as long as his basic rules were followed. Or like this quote from The New Vegas Libertopia would be a place where the strong prey on the weak, ruling without limits as long as their strength lasts, and the weak are continuously trampled, lulled by the dream of becoming strong themselves one day. As for basic physical needs, Mr. House and his free economic zone of New Vegas are more than capable of providing food, water, shelter, and health care for its inhabitants, so long as they are paying customers or work for him, or any of the three families who run the casinos. He cares little for anyone else. The safety and security of New Vegas are in good hands with Mr. House, as it's in his best interest that there are no major threats to him or his economic juggernaut. As would be the case if the NCR were to withdraw from the Mojave, in their place would be Mr. House's Mark II Securitrons to police the wasteland. In terms of economic stability, it's the entire purpose of his existence, and will continue to be until the world is destroyed again, so that need is satisfied with ease. The needs of the mind and heart are mostly upheld as House encourages ingenuity, innovation, and culture with the only stipulation being that it needs to bring him profit and not undermine his authority. The expression of oneself and individualism can go about unfettered, except in the political realm. There is no use in trying to change House's mind there. And that leaves just justice and equality, where I find it to be a little tricky to evaluate House. He is unconcerned with right or wrong other than upholding the business dealings and contracts that he engages with. 
Everything is transactional to him, and ethics need not apply. The rule of law that he employs is based on maintaining a specific brand of order that gets him closer to his goals. That House seems to hold no prejudice or savage beliefs is more just a byproduct of wanting to keep those sweet, sweet caps flowing. And it would be hard to convince people to keep going to your sex, drugs, and gambling paradise if they're worried you'll slaughter them or turn them away for being the wrong type of human. So, I don't know. There's justice and equality in there somewhere. If you get mugged on his turf, you'll probably be taken care of, if only to ensure that rumors don't spread about the strip being some dangerous hellhole. And so all that leaves us with the choice between the three major players. The bear, the bull, and the technocrat. One has pulled democracy from its own rubble, brushed it off, and told itself that it's still the only path forward. One has shed the burden of human rights to achieve their lofty goals. One has convinced themselves that humanity is the pesky middleman standing between him and technological progress. Based on what we've learned, which one should be handed the keys to the Mojave? It's a genuinely difficult question to answer, and really the whole conceit of the game. There are elements to each one that are deeply concerning, along with some that are extremely encouraging. Caesar's Legion can point to efficiency and unity that is matched only by its savage brutality. The NCR can rely on its civility and rule of law to mask its propensity for corruption. Mr. House can argue that both are failed experiments stretched up from the past while offering a future that only includes him and those strong and wealthy enough to keep up without upsetting his rule, leaving everyone else to fend for themselves. That being said, I think, reluctantly, I have to choose the new California Republic. Sure, they aren't perfect and could very well embody the very values, systems, and forces that led to the Great War. But there is a reason that mankind seems to keep trusting that system. They satisfy the five needs of a society better than the others. Basic physical needs, safety and security, economic stability, needs of the mind and heart, and justice and equality. They are all met and well represented under the NCR. Perhaps war never changes. Perhaps all roads of humanity lead to self-destruction. But it's civility, decency, and a sense of fucking hope that there's more to life than servitude to a god king or to profit that acts as the scenic route that pushes back against the inevitable descent to total annihilation. As Winston Churchill has been dubiously attributed to saying, democracy is the worst form of government, except for all those other forms that have been tried. And with that, let me know what you think in the comments. Tell me how wrong and dumb I am for choosing the NCR. And remember that you are worth it. I hope you can find the people, things, and activities around you that make you happy, healthy, and kind. Your darkest moments don't define you, and there's always a tomorrow. Have a nice day.